our trio. That was wonderful. Margie sprang this song on him Wednesday of this week. And, uh, and that was because uh, of a discussion we had about, about my message today. And I have to say, Margie, you did pick a great song. It really does introduce the themes of our scripture in a very powerful way. turn our attention to the presence of God in this room at this time as we go to our Lord in prayer. Lord, before we woke up, you were already here, waiting to receive our worship and praise. It's an honor to know that you care, that you pay attention to us, that you know us and want to make yourself known to us. Lord, we pray that your spirit would lift us up it is because of your grace that we are here. It is because of your grace that we can be forgiven. Your grace puts us on an even playing field, creates a community, a community saved by you. Lord, may we experience the power of being the church today, the privilege of being your children and calling you our Heavenly Father. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Well, kids, I want to share something with you. I want to tell you a story that Jesus told about a man that went out and looked for some people to work in his field. He had a vineyard and needed some workers, so he went out and he hired some people to work all day long. So I brought this rope to remind me that they worked all day long. And while they were out there working, he said, you know, there's a lot of work to be done, so I need to go and get some more people so halfway through the day, he got some more people. They didn't work quite as long, but they, they worked very hard. It was getting towards the end of the day, and there was still some work to be done. And so he goes out, and he finds some more people with only a little bit of time left in the day. They're still standing out there waiting to be hired, hoping that somebody would hire them. Why haven't you you've been working all this time? Because nobody would hire us, they said to the man. He said, that's okay, I'll hire you. Come and work in my vineyard, and I'll pay you what is right. So all these different people were out there working, and then at the end of the day, it came time for them to get paid. And so he called them up to be paid. First, he called up the people that had worked for a little bit of time, and he paid them a denarius. A denarius is basically the amount of money that it takes to live for one day. So that was the basic day's wage. He gave them, even though they only worked a little while, he gave them enough to live that day. Then the people that worked part of the day, they came forward. They probably thought, oh, we might be getting a little bit more. But instead, he gave them also the denarius, just what they needed, enough for today, because that was a fair wage for a day's work. Then the people that worked uh, all day long came forward, and they too received a denarius, the same pay. Now, all, all groups of people should have been happy because they got their, meet, their needs met for that day. Jesus taught us to, to, to pray for our daily bread, and they would have their needs met for that day. But uh, they weren't very happy, and the reason is because even though they had worked different lengths of times, the employer treated them like they were all equal. Now you see all three ropes of the same size. The people who came out there first got equal pay. The people that came out there second got equal pay. And the people who came out there third got equal pay. And that tells us that God treats us equally. God wanted them to see each other as being equals as well. I'm going to tie these ropes together now and connect them. Because God wants us to connect in community. <clears throat> Now you see the three equal length of rope. They are all connected in unity. These three equal ropes remind me that God is three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit, and that he wants us to create a community where we are all connected and treat each other equally as well. You see, the neat thing, if we can pretend like this first rope is God, 
is that when we connect to God and we tie ourselves to God, that even though we are individuals, we become one. We, we become one through the power of God's Spirit. So now you see, all we've got is God, and the, uh, the full length is one that represents the church community. It's neat how much a, a few pieces of rope can teach us about the power of God and how God should bring us together. Let us think about that as we go to our Lord in prayer at this time. Lord God, you call together people from different walks of life, from different areas of the community. Some are rich and some are poor, but as we just heard from the trio, your grace is given equally to both. Your grace, the gift of your love, brings us together and makes us the same, that we are all part of the same family, that we are all your children. And through that, that oneness, we became the church, the new kingdom. Lord, may we continue to advance that kingdom and bring other people in. And may we see in our neighbor, in our friend, someone that's worthy of your love. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our children are dismissed for Children's Church at this time. <coughs> Let us hear the story the way Jesus told it in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard. I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon, and he did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were, were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go home. I want to give to the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. And the Lord bless the reading of this word. This is not exactly people's favorite parable. It's actually a pretty taboo parable. We like parables about lost sheep because they're cuddly. But um, the topics covered in this parable, they hit a little bit close to home. They ruffle our feathers a bit. I mean, first of all, it's taboo to talk about salaries. You don't talk about what people make. One of the number one reasons for an employee being disgruntled in the workplace is if that employee finds out that a coworker is making more money than him. You don't talk about salaries. You don't talk about money. Isn't that what we're taught? And this landowner, if he had just paid people quietly, they would have gone home and never realized what was going on. But he was very intentional. He wanted to pay the last ones first and the first ones last so that there would be open transparency about his business practices so that they could see what he was doing and how he was treating everyone. This is a taboo parable because, well, you know, you've got people who worked hard and you've got people who hardly worked at all, yet they all get paid the same. It, it kind of reminds me of those companies that have uh, employee ownership, where the person who's a janitor and the CEO all make the same pay. They all have an equal share of the company. If a politician were to go out and tell a story like Jesus told this morning, 
and, and then insinuate that this is the goal or the way that he would operate this country, that politician would be accused of being a socialist. It would be a very controversial topic. And then minimum wage, you know, that denarius, he agreed to pay them a denarius. That was basically the minimum wage. So this brings up all these issues about, you know, should we raise the minimum wage? And what about un unemployment? Is it right for people to, to get, get that minimum amount to live off of if they haven't re really worked? And so, you know, this, this parable rubs up against a lot of issues that we have going on in our world today. But that denarius was the amount that it took to live, no more, no less. And this goes against our attitudes towards achievement. It goes against our drive and our need to achieve. We get upset when, when schools pass out participation trophies where everyone gets an award because we want to be the best. If, if we can't be better than the person next to us, then what's the drive to keep going? That's the competition mentality. There was a principal who got in trouble because uh, at graduation, he decided that this year would be different. Everyone would be wearing the same black robe. There would be no cords, no badges, no honor, uh, honors recognized. When the names are called, there would just be names, no acknowledgement of who, uh, you know, who, who had the highest grade or who had the lowest grade. He wanted them all to be equal. Now, naturally, the parents of the high-achieving kids, they were the ones who grumbled about this the loudest. But the principal explained that he wanted to teach the kids a lesson, that when they crossed that stage and they got that diploma, that it didn't matter if making the grades came easy to them or if they had to work and struggle and just barely got by. The moment they walked across that stage and got that diploma, they all graduated. They were all the same, and they could go out into this world and get a job. And isn't that what, what Jesus is trying to say here, that, that for some of us being a Christian, we can't even remember how it all started. We've just always been in church. Others of us might have come to Christ very late in life and just barely got into the kingdom of God by the skin of our teeth. But all that matters is that you graduate, that you make it. You see, this parable is supposed to be hard to swallow. It's supposed to get our attention. It's supposed to rub up against what we define as, as culturally normal. It's supposed to be shocking. All parables are. We just tend to be so disconnected that we miss the abrasiveness of it. You know, none of us in here have ever raised sheep, so we miss the abrasiveness of the parable of a shepherd that would lead the 99 irresponsibly to go after that one. We, we miss the, the, the difficulties of the parables like that farmer who threw seed in all the wrong places and expected them to grow. There's always something about a parable that's shocking. That's, that's the whole point. So the fact that, that we could be offended by this parable today, the fact that it, it, it rubs up against all these different issues in our world today and, and challenges us, well, that, that's good. That means that this parable still has its effectiveness. You're not supposed to like it. You're supposed to let it affect who you are. You're supposed to think about it all day and for the rest of the week and let it challenge and reshape you from the inside out. It might help to know the context. It helped me when I realized the context in which this parable appears. It's not in isolation, but it's surrounded by the rest of the gospel, and it happens right after the incident where a, a rich young man comes up to Jesus and wants to enter the kingdom of God. He wants to know what he's got to do, and Jesus says, oh, it's easy. All you got to do is just sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And come follow me. And, of course, the, the young man had a lot of wealth, and so that was... Too much to ask of him, and so he went away sad. And then Jesus went on to explain about how difficult it would be for a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of God, that it'd be easier to squeeze a camel through the eye of a needle. And of course, that was as much as saying it's impossible. And when he got called out on that by his disciples, Jesus said, well, with man, this is impossible. But with God, nothing's impossible. This is the context for this story about the working class. It comes from at the heels of this story told about a rich man, a rich man who turned his face from the opportunity to enter the kingdom and went his own way. I imagine that when that rich man walked away, that some of the working class folks there probably felt pretty good about themselves. They thought, okay, 
This rich guy always thinks he has it all. And look, we're the ones with Jesus, and, and you know, he missed out on a great opportunity. Oh, this rich man, he's the one that's always looking down his nose on other people. He's the one that's always looking at us and assigning value. This person is worth that to me. This person is worth that to me. I'm so glad I'm not like that rich man, the workers thought self-righteously. I'm not like that rich man. I don't have values, value systems in which I judge people. I don't have these biases in which I operate, whether intentional or unintentional. I don't participate in, in, in racism and ageism and all these isms that divide us. No, when we're working, we're working side by side and we're all the same. In fact, we all belong to the same labor union. We go to those, those same meetings together and we're united because we know that workers, when we're, we're united for a common goal, that we can get more accomplished. When Jesus knew the attitudes of the workers and he didn't want them to become self-righteous, so he tells a story that makes them realize that they could be just as judgmental as the rich man given the right circumstances. Well, let me tell you how. Imagine if you worked all day and somebody didn't. Imagine that this group over here gets chosen first, day after day, week after week. Imagine that this group over here gets overlooked day after day, week after week. Don't you think you might be tempted to think that you're a little bit better than them? Won't you be a little bit tempted to look down your nose and to assign a value system where you put yourself above them? You might not be quite as united as you think. So think about who are the ones who are picked first. Well, you know, the attractive people would be picked first. They would stand out of the, out of the crowd. People that, that looked like the rich man. People that dressed more like the rich man. He's, he would gravitate towards those things as we oftentimes gravitate towards things that are similar to us. They're strong. You know, if you're, if you're looking for somebody to hire, you want to get the most bang for your buck. So you want to find the strong person. You don't want a weak person. So you... There would be value assessments being made on who's strong, and, and, and they'll get picked first. It's often, it's a lot like uh, in school when, when, when teams were being picked for baseball. You know, you got to pick your classmates, and you wanted the biggest and tallest and strongest person on your team. So you could pick them first to make sure the other team didn't get them. Well, that's what was going on here day after day as they all stood out there needing employment. The experience, you can look and tell who has done this for a while and, and who's a newcomer. Who looks like they're experienced? That's the ones that you want. The ones who are well-dressed or well-equipped. If you're looking for a brick mason and you see a guy with a, a, a trial in his back pocket, and, and, you know, that, that's who you want. You want the person that comes with his own equipment that looks like he's prepared for this job. So if that's who gets picked first day after day. Who gets picked last? Well, the disabled would be overlooked. Those disabled people, they might have been hard workers who were injured on the job. But now their injuries cause them to fall back and get selected less and less. They work less and less. They make less and less money, even though their hospital bills keep going up. The elderly. The elderly would have been overlooked. Oh, you know, that person's a liability. I need someone younger and stronger. Those who looked inexperienced. If the, if the oldest in the group were overlooked, the youngest in the group. Well, that kid looks like he's fresh out of high school. You know, he doesn't have enough experience under his belt. So we're going to skip over that person too. But how is that young person ever going to get, get any experience and have something to put on that resume if no one will take a chance on it? The women. The women would be overlooked. What about that poor widow who, whose husband died and, and left her with nothing and now she's just scraping to get by? Surely she can find employment too. Even, even this many years after... Uh, you know, the women's liberation movement and, and women's salaries still pale in comparison to, to, to men. A woman can, can climb the ranks, but, but still won't get paid the same as the top positions. What about the foreigner? He doesn't talk like I do, so it might be difficult for me to communicate with. He, he, doesn't, uh, he didn't grow up around here, so I'm gonna uh, focus on people that, that did first. How do we treat the foreigner? How would they have been, been picked uh, you know, last instead of first? So you think about these two groups, you, you, you understand what's going on here, that there's this division uh, uh, across many different, different lines of who would be picked first and who would be picked last. 
Now here's the real issue. The people who got picked first, they were the ones that were upset. Did they work hard? Yes. Did they earn their money? Yes. Did they get paid what they agreed to? Yes. Not a penny less. They agreed to a denarius. That was a fair wage for the, for the day's labor they, they got. But the real issue, the reason they were angry was not because they expected or, or needed more than, than their fair share. No, it's stated, it says, you have made them equal to us. That division between the, the first class workers and the, and, and the last, uh, you know, the last string workers, that division had, had been uh, made very clear in their minds. It had become a, a social divide. And to have those people on the bottom, to have them be, be treated and made equal to us, that was what they were so offended about. And that gets us to the radical kingdom point of this parable. The radical kingdom point that goes against our experiences in the workplace, that goes against our experiences in school, that goes against our experiences with the world in general. The radical kingdom point. When Jesus says the kingdom of God is like this, he's trying to show us that the kingdom of God is different from what you expect and different from what you have experienced. Because in the kingdom of God, God loves each of us the same. And it's not dependent on what we do. See, some of us work really hard. Maybe we serve on a bunch of committees. And so we think, well, God is going to favor us. We're trying to earn our salvation. Maybe even in church because we have pulled our time and been here our whole life. You know, our opinion should matter more than someone who, who walks into this door and, and just professes faith and gets baptized. What have they done? They haven't pulled their time. But God loves us each the same. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. There's nothing you can do to earn God's favor. God loves us because he chooses to love us. If we're not careful, Jesus warns, we might develop an attitude of spiritual entitlement. Spiritual entitlement is, is sometimes we mistakenly think that we have earned and thus deserve God's grace. And by doing so, we forget that grace is actually a gift. That's when we become entitled. Well, I'm a good person. I can show you my, my bank statements and how, how much I have tithed and how consistent I've been. I can show you my perfect attendance records. We develop the sense of, of entitlement, entitlement to God, that we are God's chosen. Yeah, they had that in Jesus' day as well. Even, even John the Baptist, when those who were spiritually entitled came out and he treated everybody equally, he said, okay, you're coming out here to this water because you're curious. And you see these people that haven't been living the best lifestyle, you see them getting baptized and making a decision for God. And you're worried about the people that I'm letting in to this whole, whole family of God business. Well, I tell you that God can raise up children of Abraham from the stones beneath our feet that don't think you're entitled. God can create loyal followers wherever he, he chooses because God can be generous with his grace and give it to whomever he chooses. But see, we, we misunderstand gift because, well, we're, we're in the wish list culture. When it comes to birthdays and holidays, there are no more surprises. Instead, all year long, you find things as you... Uh, browse on your phone in your free time you find things and you add them to that wish list and so then when it comes time for gifts you start sending out links these are the things that I want and so rather than a gift being this surprise thing that that you never expected that you never deserved that someone gives you out of their love for you instead it becomes a ransom a demand list these are the things that I want these are the things that I expect and I feel like that has translated over into our attitudes towards the gifts from God. God, these are the things I want. These are the things uh, that I need. And, and this is when I want them and how I want them. Do we treat God, even in our prayer life, like as though we're putting together a wish list? There was a father who surprised his son one morning. He got up early. And while his son was still sleeping, he packed lunch and packed a bag. Uh, he had the day off and he was going to spend it with his son. So they piled into the car after he got his, his boy's shoes tied. And he took him out to this, this spot on the lake that he used to go as a kid that was so meaningful to him. He had some good father and son moments with his father. And he wanted to recreate those moments with his son. By the time they drove all the way out there, it was lunchtime. So he sat him down on a rock by the water and gave him his lunch. 
bag of potato chips, a peanut butter sandwich. Dad's not a number one cook, but he knows how to spread peanut butter between two slices of bread. The kid sits down and opens up his bag and says, but it's Friday. I always have pizza on Friday. I expected to have pizza. Well, my son, you know, this is this is what I, I provided for you. Well, I don't care. I want pizza. Well, son, you, you, you get what you get and, and don't get upset. And, and he sat him down and he had a little talking to with his son. He said, yeah, I'm, I've provided you with so many things. I'm trying to provide you with this good experience. And you're so busy being upset about what you think you're entitled to that you didn't get that you can't even appreciate what you have been given. Those shoes on your feet, you have those because I provided those for you. The clothes on your back, the safety that you take for granted as you sleep and rest each night in the house that belongs to me. I let you live there. I brought you into this world. I'm raising you. Everything about your existence is a gift from me because I love you. Rather than being upset about what you don't have, why not focus on what you do have and realize the gifts that you've been given? Paul said it this way. He said, I've learned the secret of being content. So many people are, are not content in this world because they're looking at what somebody else has and they're jealous. They, they've got the sense of entitlement and think this is what I deserve. And why am I not getting what I deserve? But instead, Paul realized he deserved nothing. He said, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So what do we deserve? That's something we need to prayerfully think about. Reflect on your life. Reflect on the things that you have done. Anybody sinned in here? Anybody made mistakes? Anybody acted in, in a way that they wouldn't want the whole world to know? And then contrast that with God's love and God's holiness. And I think we'll figure out that, well, we don't deserve much, do we? Romans 6, 23, the first part says... For the wages of sin is death. So what do we deserve? We deserve nothing. We deserve death. We don't even deserve the life that we have. We don't deserve the air that we breathe. We woke up this morning. We didn't deserve to be here. It was a gift. The fact that you were able to get up and come into this church today, you weren't entitled to that. Today is a gift. This moment in your life is a gift. What we deserve is nothing. But what do we get? The rest of that verse says, but the gift, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We deserve nothing, but yet we get everything because God loves us that much. Well, as it turns out, life is not fair. That's what they thought in the parable. Life is not fair. Maybe you've thought it. As you see someone else that achieves when when you weren't recognized. As you see somebody else that, that you think is living a more comfortable life than you. Life is not fair. I deserve what that person has. Well, Scripture doesn't argue with you. Scripture affirms life is not fair. Life is not fair. And this works out pretty good for us. It works out pretty good for us because we deserve nothing. But Jesus sent us the greatest gift of all, the gift of his one and only son, the thing that was the most precious to him. He let go of that and released his son into this world that his son might save a few. He released his son into this world and his son gave his life to be a ransom for many to pay the debt of our sin. What we deserve was punishment. Jesus took that punishment onto himself and said, I'm going to end it and I'm going to give you the life that I have earned eternal life for all who come and follow me. Life is not fair and it works out great and for that I give God all the glory. Okay, so we've caught a glimpse of a different world, a different kingdom. A world where God treats people equally, where everyone gets the same reward, where everyone gets the same pay because everyone is viewed as equal. What happens if we started valuing other people that way? What would happen as we go out into our world? What would happen if we looked at our neighbor and saw someone that was equal to us? What, hap what happened if we, when we took our car to the shop 
we interacted with that mechanic, that we viewed that person as being equal to us. What would happen if when we get into a dispute with a friend because their opinion varies drastically from ours? Rather than name call or put that person down, what if we realized that they were equal because we are all equal, because we deserve nothing but have been given the chance at everything? Let us think about this as we go to our word of prayer. Lord God, we love you, and we are just in awe of the grace that we have received through your son, Jesus Christ. There was such a great price to be paid, and Jesus satisfied it with his own life. As his arms stretched out on that cross in pain for us, Jesus was saying to us, to the world, this is how much I love you. Those outstretched arms were wide enough to embrace a world of pain, a broken world full of broken people. Because through that one person, through that one point in history, a doorway was opened up, an opportunity was created to be right with you. Lord, maybe we accepted that grace in our life so many years ago that we can barely remember. May we not take that grace for granted. May we not forget the price that you paid and realize there's nothing that we could ever do to deserve the grace that we've been given. Likewise, Lord, as we see those who receive that grace much later than us, as we see people who come and, and accept Jesus Christ, rather than Rather than, than being resentful, Lord, may we rejoice. Just as that shepherd finds his lost sheep, just as that woman finds her lost coin, just as the prodigal father finds the prodigal son. Lord, may those things that are lost be found and may all who are already in your grace be happy and celebrate. But so often we stand back like the other brother, not joining in the celebration. Lord, forgive us for those times when we felt entitled, when we looked down on others, when we failed to catch a glimpse of the image of God that's in each and every person on this earth. All that we do down here should be directing us to you. We celebrate your kingdom. May we come into it. May things be on earth as they are in heaven. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you can make that decision today. You can come forward as we sing our, our last song, Amazing Grace, with grace greater than our sin. You can come forward and make a decision to be baptized. If you're already a baptized believer and would like to transfer your membership, then come forward as we sing the song and, and we will discuss that as well. Let us stand and think about the decisions that we have to make today in our hearts as we all sing this song together. <laughs>